Still talking about iniquity today. You're having coffee with Conrad. Conrad rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. I'm still on the subject of iniquity. I'm Conrad from ConradRocks.net. I have a passion for the lukewarm. Why are we Christians? Let's get that, let's relight that fire. Let's take some ground for Jesus. It's much more fun to be sold out. Amen. It's much more fun to see lives change than to watch, you know, TV. Come on. (laughs) It's a lot of fun. I have a passion for you to develop a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. I talk a lot about walking after the Spirit. Just so you know, you can find all my podcasts, YouTube videos on my Conrad Rocks app, which is free on Android and on Apple. So you can find all that, all the stuff. It's right there. Even a lot of my social media. So God bless you. Now we're going to talk about iniquity. What, what got me off on this is I'm not really sure. I just ponder about iniquity a lot. I've always been fascinated, even when I was in a backslidden condition, about the human mind. Why do we do the things that we do? And like I did things like, uh, I studied things like neuro-linguistic programming. How is a habit formed? You know, and it's kind of like a blind man. I'm groping this text written by secular people trying to make sense of why we develop habits how do we how do we instill good habits um all the crazy stuff i even did the rubber band on the wrist thing like every time you had a bad thought i would slap myself with a rubber band thinking that i could control my thoughts that way and that works to a point um but i'm talking about real deliverance the kind that where you are set free in an instant. I'm talking about iniquities. Iniquities start, you know, there there's iniquities that are passed down from the fathers to the third and fourth generation. If you follow me, I talk about generational curses a lot. And, you know, like uh, even, even Christians, we were talking uh, yesterday about how the Jews that believed on Jesus, but they didn't love him and they didn't keep his word. So they're saying, we're children of Abraham, but Jesus says, you're the father of the devil, right? So even a lot of us that are Christians will say, yeah, well, I'm free, but you're not. You still have these iniquities, okay? Um, You'll say, well, I'm a Christian, therefore I, I don't have any problems. But you still have these desires to do these wicked things. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about iniquity. And these iniquities... When you're delivered from these iniquities, the obsession is no longer there. It's gone. If it's alcohol, you no longer desire. If it's video games, you no longer think about it while you're at work. You know, it no longer dominates your life. Jesus says, whoever sins is a servant of sin. That that iniquity is the things that you cannot stop thinking about. Also, another thing is, it's a, a a good way of identifying it from my personal experience, if it's something that you would do, if you knew you wouldn't get punished for it, if you knew you could get away with it, but you also know God doesn't approve of it, that's an iniquity. That's a desire that we need to deal with. And I'm always talking about sanctification. If a man purges himself from these, he's meet and useful for the master. And I, I love this because walking in freedom, walking in victory is the most I mean, I want to say liberating, but it's awesome. It's awesome. That's why we're talking about this. I have a passion for you to develop a spiritual relationship and things like iniquities. Jesus is bruised for our iniquities, right? He's bruised for our iniquities, so we're he's taken them on himself. But when we appropriate, when, when Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free, and who the Son sets free is free indeed. When we know the truth and the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. 
Amen? So I'm going to talk about some more verses. And I was musing myself, uh, musing about this stuff. And I want to kind of muse with you under the guidance of the Spirit of Truth. Amen? The psalmist talks about iniquity, and he talks about meditating in the Word. Remember how Jesus said, You have not my Word abiding in you? You know, and, and the psalmist is always talking about meditating in your precepts and the precepts of the Lord. Joshua one eight, God is telling Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. And I want you to think the psalmist and Joshua, they didn't have T V. They didn't have radio, these iniquity things pouring into them, right? The Word of God was not diluted with the junk of the world that we have today. So they were walking in much more victory simply because they didn't have the wicked pollution come into their thought life. They did have pollution, but not, not the, the kind that we have today. So Psalm eighteen twenty one through 24, For I have kept the ways of the Lord, and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. Now, the iniquity can be purged. You remember how I, I was taking a shower, and I listen. Sometimes I'll bring the Bible into the shower, so and I'll play it loud enough so I can hear over the water. Um, and I was hearing this this verse in Isaiah, Isaiah verse fourteen. Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die. I heard that in my office, and it parked in my spirit. A day or two goes by, and then I hear in Leviticus about it's, it's somewhere in the Torah the the Levites shall bear the iniquity of the congregation and then they lay their hands on the offering and then they slay the offering I want you to understand something there's a transference of iniquity when Jesus says he's bore our iniquities on the cross okay we not only need to know that right we know that we need to appropriate it okay you'll know the truth the truth will make you free, right? So we need to know that Jesus bore our iniquities, and then we need to appropriate it. So let me give you this example. The Israel commits a sin, and the priests, they acknowledge their sin, they confess their sin, they don't want to be plagued with that iniquity anymore. So the priests would bear the iniquities of the congregation, they would lay their hands on the sacrifice and kill the sacrifice. That iniquity, let's just look at it this way. That iniquity would transfer from the congregation to the priest, the priest to the sacrifice, and then it dies and it's released. Okay? Let me give you another example. The demoniac, the legions. Remember, we are legions for we're many. So they begged Jesus to be cast into the pigs. Then they ran down to the pigs, and they killed all the pigs, and they were released, right? So the iniquity, and the demoniac from the gatherings was then in his right mind. That iniquity, those demons, had passed from the demoniac to the pigs, and then they're released into the, because they died. The pigs died. So iniquity is transferred. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm, I, he has bore our iniquities. He's bruised for our iniquities. Amen? We just need to appropriate that. Now, the psalmist here is saying, I've kept my ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. This means he's in the text. He's reading the text. He, he's getting familiar with God, right? And you'll notice it's, there's sometimes in the, the Old Testament there in the Torah when someone becomes aware of their sin, then they confess and repent. Have you ever noticed that as you continually get intimate with the text... You'll go, oh, I didn't realize that I had a problem in this area. Then you confess and you repent. And it's liberating because oftentimes, if that is a problem, you will be purged of that problem. A lot of people don't understand that uh, they'll have things in their house, <laughs> devoted things, 
and they don't understand why they're having they're not having victory in certain things you know basically you're giving a permission for a curse to be in your house and the demons that are attached to it will stay there and give you problems so as you read the text you go wait a minute i'm not supposed to have oh my gosh this is actually idolatry or something like that you become aware of it then you get it out same thing like iniquity you become aware of your sin and you want to get it out of your spirit you want to get it out of your soul so he's kept his ways before the Lord. He's not departed wickedly from God. And he did not put away his statutes. So he knew the statutes and ordinances. This is a psalmist. I was also upright before him. And I kept myself from mine iniquity. Now this is something I want you to understand. God is a person. He's not a formula. Yesterday we were talking about whom the Son sets free is free indeed. It says, you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. Now Jesus is the truth. The truth is a person. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So Jesus then says in verse 36 of John chapter 8, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So the truth is a person. Now, that's why I'm always emphasizing having a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Here's the psalmist. He knows the text. He's keeping his ways before the Lord. He says, I've not wickedly departed from my God. So he knows what's right and wrong from the text that he's reading. He knows the statutes before him. He says, I was also up right before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Now, what this means is he's not giving in to the sin that he wants to give in to. So he's keeping himself from doing those wicked things. One way of doing that is if you don't, do not approximate the environment that causes you to stumble. Another way of saying that, if you think you have a tendency to slip, do not go to slippery places. Keep yourself from that iniquity. If you have overcome, if you're quitting drugs, for instance, don't drive through the neighborhood where you used to buy drugs. <laughs> okay, Keep yourself from that iniquity. Now, the desire is still in there. It's what a lot of people call dry drunks. They don't drink anymore, but they still have the desire to drink. The psalmist is saying he is keeping himself from his iniquity. Now, here's an instance in... Um, 1 Samuel, and I heard this today on my devotions, God has a way, I'm just going to tell you guys, if you listen to the Bible over and over and over again, uh, for me, it gets exciting. I get excited because the Spirit of Truth, the Word says, He will guide you into all truth, and you'll be made free. And there's this excitement I get because God has a way of me coming right into the room at the right time, or it'll be in my devotion, or it'll be in a book that I'm reading, or whatever. He has a way of tying it all together, and I just get excited. I mean, uh, I, I wish you would catch this excitement. It's awesome. But he was talking about iniquity. In 1 Samuel 3.13, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. So Eli, if you remember, he was the high priest around the time of Samuel. Remember, Samuel was sleeping next to the, to the Ark of the Covenant. And he was supposed to restrain his kids. And his kids were doing some wicked, vile things. They were sleeping with the women at the door of the tent. They were taking the offerings by force, right? And he said, hey, guys, stop doing this. And, and the Torah says, hey, you know what? You're supposed to stone your kids to death if they do not repent basically they did not repent nor they believe did they believe the word you understand that when you don't repent you are not acting upon what the word says to do god is a relationship not a religion god is a relationship he's not a formula god's a person so here god is talking that he will judge the house of eli for the iniquity which he knows Eli knew the iniquity, but he didn't do anything about it because his sons made themselves vile. He was in authority over his grown sons. You may find it interesting, but in this case, he was in authority over them. 
and he restrained them not. Therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that this iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. So sometimes God allows the iniquity to stay with us, right? And we need to figure that out. There's there's more than one reason, I'm sure. Isaiah twenty two thirteen and 14, And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. And it was revealed in mine ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, saith the Lord God of hosts. This is kind of why I was talking about the swine earlier. The iniquity, the demons are in there. They're, they're, they have permission by the curse. They're plaguing you. And they do not leave these people until they die. And this is a decision that the Lord has made. Amen? So the idea is to have a desire to get right with God. I'm going to tell you that's probably the first thing. And not to seek his face and not his hand. You know what I'm saying? If you're just seeking to get rid of your iniquity, um, I, I can understand that. I mean, who wants to have an iniquity? But the reason we want to get rid of iniquity is usually we're, we're tired of our sin. We're sorry, we're sorry that we've offended God. Let me put it that way. We hate that we keep trampling underfoot the Son of God. We have a true, we have a true love for God, and I believe that's the most sincere um, form of repentance is like, look, Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. Please help me in this area, right? So let's move on to a couple of other verses. Matthew seven twenty one through 24. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Then I'll profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me that work iniquity. So here we have Christians, and he's talking about Judgment Day. This could be the day that you stand before the Lord, right? And these are people that say, well, I'm a covenant person. Kind of like the people said, oh, we have Abraham to our father. And you're fooling yourselves because you don't have a relationship. And I know that because the text says they didn't know Jesus. Right? They didn't have a relationship they knew about him. As a matter of fact, they were prophesying in the name of Jesus. And obviously, since they didn't know Jesus, they couldn't be prophesying in his name. They were prophesying lies from their heart, a wicked deceit. You know, so They were deceiving themselves in, in the prophetic. They've cast out devils and had done many wonderful works. And I will profess them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So, um, the deal is, it's not the fact that they had the iniquity, that they had not appropriate... It's not the fact that they had the iniquity, it's the fact that they were working in the iniquity, and they did not know Jesus, right? We need to know Jesus. And as we know Jesus, we shall know the truth. Jesus is the truth, and he makes us free, right? So, we've got to have a relationship. These people refused to follow the Spirit of Jesus Christ. They, they did not have the Spirit abiding in him. As Romans says, whosoever hath not the Spirit is none of his. You've got to have the Spirit of Christ. They refused to listen to the Spirit. They refused to obey the Word, the text that points to Jesus. And they formed their own brand of Christianity. And uh, they fooling themselves that they were saved. Now, I'm going to tell you something interesting. You know, Paul, Paul even had a problem here. Paul, the apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord three times, thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, a lot of people struggle with the fact that Paul had this problem. And some people like to say, oh, Paul had a demon. Um, well, there he definitely had a problem with a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. A lot of people say, well, uh, somebody buffeting, 
that has to be done from the outside. Amen? So I'm not really going to deal with whether the demon was in him or outside of him, but the thing is, he had a problem with the demon. Now, this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, here's the deal. Paul knew the truth, okay? And this this is the point that I want to make. Paul knew the text. He had the text memorized, right? So before Acts chapter 9, he had the Torah memorized. He had a lot of the prophets memorized. I mean, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He sat at the top theologian's feet. Then he meets Jesus. And even though he meets Jesus, this is post-cross, okay? Jesus has already been risen from the dead. So we're in the new covenant, right? Jesus was bruised for Paul's iniquities. Even though he knew Jesus, he knew to pray and ask for God to deliver him. But the Lord did not deliver him because he knew that Paul would have a problem with pride. Do you see? So he then says, I will glory in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So sometimes when we have these problems and we desperately want to get rid of them, we may even pray three times and God won't deliver us. There's a there's a reason. And it's not, like I said, God is not a formula. He's not a religion that we're supposed to obey. He is a person. And notice that Paul had a dialogue with him. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God is not really interested in you being exalted in the eyes of man. Do you understand that? He's not, he's not really caring about your ministry, <laughs> what people think of you. It's what God thinks of you that matters. Pride comes before a fall. Paul had fallen. He was all that in a bag of chips as a Pharisee. He was, he was a big deal in ministry before he met Jesus. And then he fell. And it's a good thing that he fell because he got saved after that. Amen? So then... He didn't want to get back to that pride. He was going to go back to that pride. So the Lord let him have a messenger of Satan to buffet him, to give him problems, to give him struggles, so that he would not fall back into the sin of pride. Amen? So just remember that. when Sometimes when we have things that are bothering us, we need to to develop a relationship with God and say, Lord, what's up with this? Please reveal this to me. This is why I, Conrad from Conrad Rocks, my passion is for you to develop a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. Amen? Keep seeking. Keep seeking. God bless you. If this has helped you, please share this with your friends via email, Facebook, whatever. And uh, you can check out the app. Tell people to get the app, the Conrad Rocks app. It's free on Android and on Apple. Get it for free. Carry me with you wherever you go. God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.